This video in the Morgan Three Wheeler Workshop Series will show you how to remove the clutch, how to remove the flywheel, inspect them both for damage, how to open up the back of the bell housing so that you can get access to the centre coupling and how to remove that centre coupling. The first thing we're going to do is to dismantle the clutch. I've taken most of the bolts out already. That's just the last one. And there we can see the clutch plate. Unfortunately this one has got a broken spring. That's not an unusual thing to find in these engines. The other three seem to be okay. A broken spring is a shame because I don't think there's much sign of wear on that friction plate at all. It's uh, not, not deteriorated much from new but it will have to be overhauled. The cover, as you can see, looks just like new. The plate is showing a few signs of bluing and discoloration, but that's quite normal. But you can't feel any ridges on there. You can't feel any little bubbles, blisters, nothing. That will work perfectly and will go back in as it is. And here we've got the flywheel, same situation, polished, a few little blue areas, but that's quite normal. But nothing you can feel on there, no, no ridges. In fact, as you run your fingers across that, you can feel the original grinding marks or turning marks on there. I would say that is as good as new. The pilot bearing in there looks a little bit dry, although I don't think it's suffered too much. Grease is a bit black, but otherwise I don't think we've got any problems with that. Now the next, uh, next stage is to take the flywheel off, which is a case of undoing these bolts, which I can tell you now are held on with Loctite and take quite a bit of moving. I'll show you how that happens in just a minute. So I've now loosened off the bolts in the flywheel. I use this little piece from a milling machine clamping set but anything, anything similar will do just to sprag that gear to stop it turning to, to resist the force on the spanner. Spring it out. Zip that out with a gun. should find now that without exerting undue pressure we can just pop the flywheel off and we can see that's in very nice condition starter ring gear is also in very nice condition nothing wrong with that at all now the next thing we've got to do is remove this ring of screws around here so that we can get that plate out and examine the center coupling I will warn you now, these screws are soft, they are countersunk so they only take a very small Allen key, they are Loctited in, something I don't really approve of in aluminium, and it's probably going to be necessary to heat them up from behind to break the Loctite. But I'll have a go at a few and come back to you in a minute. Well we were lucky and we didn't have to use any heat to get those screws undone. These are the offending beasts. I will not be replacing those. I have another system for doing this which is much, much friendlier towards the next guy who has to take it apart. You'll see that later on. Having got them all out, you'll see there are three extraction holes in here, draw bolt holes. Bizarrely, the threads in them are 3 8 inch BSF, 20 teeth per inch. Why that was chosen, I just do not know. Sorry to interrupt the flow of the video here, but I've just had one of those light bulb moments. I always wonder why, when I take out those aluminium plates at the back of the bell housing, 
there are always chisel marks where somebody's hammered a chisel or a screwdriver or something in in order to pull the thing out. And it's obvious now, it suddenly occurs to me, that it's because of the bizarre choice of thread for the jacking screw holes. It's 3 8 BSF. And it's only old farts like me who are likely to have some old 3 8 BSF screws around to use in those jacking holes. If you're in a workshop and the boss is chasing you to get on and do the job and you haven't got those you're going to take the other route and bash it off with a chisel. My advice to you is get some 3 8 BSF screws with a good inch of thread on them, then you can jack it off properly without doing any damage. Just taking the weight off those. Seems he's dead. Fresh. Rubbers all over the floor. Rubbers are starting to deteriorate a little bit. Some chips on the corners. A few little marks on them. A crack in the end of that one. Can you see the crack there? But not too bad, all things considered. Where's the last one? A couple of cracks starting to appear in that one. But they would have lasted, if they've done 7,000 miles, they would have lasted a good bit longer. You can see from the rubber deposits in here that they are certainly starting to show signs of wear. And I think about 10,000 miles is all you can expect from them. You will notice that when I pulled it off, it was fairly easy, just with finger pressure on those three screws. It certainly wasn't necessary to hammer a chisel in there like the last bloke did. And he didn't even take the, uh, take the trouble to clean it up and all those burrs on there were actually pushing against the side of the starter motor. I will get that cleaned up before I put it back together. Otherwise, it looks in fairly good condition. We are now removing the bell housing. It's held in place with four screws. You'll need a quarter inch hexagon drive, which is 240 or maybe about 10 inches long, to get into those four screws. They are sometimes very tight. I find putting a punch down the hole and giving them a couple of taps with a hammer sometimes frees them up a bit but it's very difficult to warm the lock tight because they're screwed into that great big crankcase which is aluminium and just takes all the heat away. So there's the bell housing waiting for modification a job that I'll uh, show you how to do very shortly. I find the best way to sprag this thing so that you can undo the big nut in the middle is with a couple of M8 screws in there. This is a confusing mixture, this area of, of, of imperial and metric screws, but everything in the centre coupling itself is metric. So two M8 screws in there, make sure they screw in a good distance. They want to be at least 20 or 25 millimetres screwed in so that they can't da do any damage. This is a 33 millimetre socket spanner. 7 8 Whitworth is what's really needed for it, but 33 millimetres is only uh, less than a tenth of a millimetre different and much easier to get hold of these days. You'll notice I've already loosened it. They are quite tight and you do need an extension pipe on the end of the socket to get them undone. This is always a confusing area. The star washer is designed to stop the thing slipping. 
it's supposed to bite into the back of the nut and into the shoulder against which the nut is being tightened. <coughs> they always have this crazy plain washer behind them which actually just allows the thing to spin so you might as well throw the star washer away. <coughs> right, put those away for later use. Now we've got to pull this thing off the crankshaft. Some people, I'm sure, use these holes with a plate or a bar across and a threaded hole in the middle as a sort of makeshift puller device. But I've made this one up, which has got a 20 ton hydraulic puller in it and three bolts that pick up on the holes in the steel part of the centre coupling at the back. The puller is now bolted in position, all the slack taken out of it, and we can just use the hydraulics now just to withdraw the coupling complete with the alternator or the alternator rotor which has the magnets in it and when this comes off you have to be careful of a couple of things one of which is that that alternator rotor at the back there has the magnets glued into it it states on it, stamped on quite clearly, no sharp blows don't whatever you do drop that or hit it because if you do the magnets will come free from their glue and then you've got a job of gluing them back on again which is no fun there she is you can see the magnets on the inside you need to put this down now somewhere where it isn't going to pick up all the nuts and bolts and bits of swarf and dust and grit and stuff there you are knocking everything on the floor as we go and a good idea once you've got it free from the back of the centre coupling you can see it's attached there by a set of screws on the inside once you've got it free from that centre coupling put it in a stout plastic bag wrap it up in some good rags whatever to stop all the bits and pieces of metallic material in the workshop from collecting on it this is the alternator rotor still fixed onto the back of the centre coupling by six countersunk socket head screws. These socket head screws, rather like the ones that hold the main plate onto the end of the bell housing, are soft. Because they're countersunk, the socket heads are very small. They are loctited in and in nine cases out of ten you will find them impossible to undo without rounding out the hexagon. If you do that you will then have to drill it out with the accompanied aggravation of all the swarf from the drilling sticking to the magnets. Now you are not supposed to strike any blows on the side of this rotor because the magnets will break away from their glue. We can however, and I've done this 22 times now I think get away with a punch which is the right size to fit nicely over the head of the screw the magnets get hold of everything you'll see centralize that on top of the screw make sure the whole unit is bolted down or fixed down onto something solid so that you don't actually knock the unit about give it a good crack on the top with a big hammer does two things. It shocks the screw, breaking the Loctite, makes it easier to get undone. It also swages in the soft material so that now when I put the Allen key into the socket it's a good tight fit and if we're lucky the screw will come undone without wrecking the hexagon. Take all six of them out in that fashion lift the alternator rotor off, wrap it up in something so it doesn't get stuff stuck onto the magnets, put it away until we're ready to reassemble. A quick test now of the double row angular contact bearing which um, is what the centre coupling runs in and what the clutch and flywheel run in. I can feel no unusual rumblings when I push down on it and turn it. 
lift up and turn it very very smooth no problems there whatsoever I can feel no play I can't rock it backwards and forwards one of the things these suffer from is the metal seals which are on the bearing I don't approve of fitting ones with metal seals in these situations because metal seals don't make a grease tight seal they're designed for stopping heavy duty swarf and stones and grit and stuff from getting into the bearing I prefer to use a rubber seal there is no reason why you shouldn't use rubber seals on here they will handle the speed they'll go up to seven and a half thousand rpm but the trouble with these metal seals that are fitted by the factory is that they do leak a bit of grease and sometimes you find all the grease has come out of the bearing and is all packed in behind the flange here my recommendation then is to change that bearing because you can't put the grease back in again